Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it might nourish us in the ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, who is the bread from heaven. First reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 to 27. Hear the word of the Lord. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome the sky, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation. Plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the cow, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning. The sixth day. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Our psalm is selected verses from Psalm 27. And to this side we'll read the bold side, and to this side we'll read the unbold side. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When you 
hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. You will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived you. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When God shows up, when the Holy Spirit shows up, New things happen. That's what we find out on the first page of the Bible. In the beginning, it says, God created heaven and earth. And in the beginning, it was formless and void. Tofu wabofu, it says in Hebrew. And you can hear what that means, can't you? It means willy-nilly. Tofu wabofu. Everything is everywhere. So what the Spirit does, what God does, is begin to draw out every part of the world and set it in a right relationship with all the other parts. He does it first with the day and the night, right? Light and dark. Day and night are set in a circular, orderly pattern. Day and night and day and night. And they don't get confused and they don't that fall out of the pattern. And then the sky, the heavens, are separated from the earth. Uh, and the sky is set above and the earth is below so that everything as it should be. And then he does the same thing, right, with the sea and the land, uh, with all the different kinds of plants so that you don't get a rose confused with an orchid, <coughs> with all the kinds of animals so that a mouse and a cat are distinguished and then with the sun and the moon and the stars, and finally with human beings, male and female, he created them, it says, in the image of God, he created them. He sets them to live at peace with each other, uh, to take care of the earth as their home, uh, to be supported, to be fed literally by its fruits, and to live in a relationship with God. That's uh, the, the crown of the orderly world is human beings who are living in a good relationship with each other and with the earth and with God. And the chapter then ends on a high note. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. But it doesn't take things too long to go badly. In chapter 1, God's spirit brings forth the world and plants and animals. But by chapter 3, the humans disobey and they start to blame each other and the good world that God made. And in chapter 4, the humans start to murder each other. And the relationships, all kinds of relationships, begin to splinter and spiral. And the story starts to sound very familiar. It can be hard, can't it, for us to imagine the first couple chapters of Genesis hard to imagine what it must have been like for humans to be completely at home and completely at peace, completely integrated and coordinated with each other and with nature and with God. 
But as things fall apart, it becomes easier to recognize ourselves and our lives in this story. We know what it's like to fight with our spouse. We know what it's like to be jealous or resentful of our siblings. We hopefully don't know what it's like to kill our siblings, but we know what it's like to not get along with them. We know what it's like to feel lonely and defensive, like the whole world is after us. Maybe we can't imagine paradise, but as Genesis continues to tell the story of the human condition, we know that the story it's telling is our story, my story, your story. And in its pages, we learn for the first time that despite all of that, God has not chosen to abandon this out-of-control, splintering world to its fate. starts with the birth of a child, and it continues with the birth of children. Israel's life in the Old Testament is marked at significant moments with surprising births, things that you couldn't have guessed beforehand. Remember how Abraham and Sarah are far too old to be having any children, but nevertheless they're given Isaac, whose name means laughter through whom all of Israel was descended. Remember how Moses was saved as a baby in a surprising way from the order to kill all the Israelite boys and instead is brought up in the palace and eventually rescues his people from slavery. Remember how Hannah, who had been unable to have a child, was given Samuel as the answer to her prayers who guided Israel as a judge and a prophet and crowned its kings. Remember Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, who, like Abraham and Sarah, is just too old to have a child, but by God's promise has John the Baptist anyway, who goes before the Lord to prepare his way. So when we think about all this, when we remember all these stories, maybe it's not that surprising that Jesus is born under strange circumstances, born, as we say in the Creed, through the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. But I think if we just chalked it up to that, we'd be making a mistake, because this birth isn't like the others, and not just because of a lack of male involvement. When the angel comes to Mary and tells her that she has found favor with God, that she will have a son who inherits the throne of David, whose kingdom will never fail, she asks very sensibly, Mary is very sensible, how is this going to happen? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. <coughs> Here comes the Holy Spirit again, just like He came at the creation of the world. Here He comes into the Toku Waboku, into the willy nilly, into the everything everywhere, into the world of splintered relationships and messy realities, into the den of pain and evil. And He comes. Not in anger, no, not to destroy it, but to make it new, to remake it. Here he comes, the Holy Spirit, to draw <coughs> peace out of the chaos, and Gabriel promises that that peace will never fail. The other surprising births scattered throughout the Bible, they whispered hints of this one. They were the shadows. They were the trailers. But now the full feature film has come. In other words, God sent help to his people. In this one, God himself is born to heal us once and for all. It's a new beginning, a new creation. Here, in this story, what we call the Annunciation, before Jesus is born, 
before the word is made flesh is the whisper of promise by the angel Gabriel that in this baby we too will be born anew. That behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. In the beginning of the world, the spirit hovered over the dark and disordered chaos and from it brought a whole world and people who were made in the image of God. But now, the Holy Spirit descends to do a new thing. In the womb of the Virgin Mary, God takes on flesh. The Creator became a creature. The Word who was from the beginning is born. In Jesus Christ, the promise and pledge of the kingdom of God takes root. In Mary's womb, the God in Mary's womb, God makes himself a new Adam. Still God, but human, like you and I are. The first Adam, as we've heard, led the world into splintered relationships and chaos and tragedy. But here is Jesus Christ, a new Adam, a new beginning for the human family, a new ancestor who is going to lead us into life and joy. We're reading C.S. Lewis in Sunday School, and he has a helpful picture for this. He says, one may think of a diver first reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in midair, and then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through the green and warm water into black and cold water, down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay, then back up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting, till suddenly he breaks the surface again, holding in his hand the dripping, precious thing that he went down to recover. In Jesus, God comes among us and lives as one of us, not just out of solidarity, not just because he felt sorry for us but so that he could lift us up out of the chaos and confusion of our brokenness, so that once again, he can set us in a healthy and positive relationship with him, and through him, with each other, and with the whole creation. When we say the Apostles' Creed, we say that we believe in the Jesus Christ who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. And when we say those things, we're not just repeating the biological history of Jesus. That's, we are doing that, but that's not all we're doing. It's a historical fact, but not only a historical fact. It's also a promise. And the promise is this, that because Christ took on a human body, and a human nature in the womb of Mary. Because in him, the Holy Spirit works a new creation. Because in his body, the alienation between human beings and God is healed. Our alienation will also be healed. All of it. All the way back to the early goings of Genesis. All of our conflict, all of our jealousy, all of our anger and murder, all the offense, all the conflict, all the disobedience, all of our homesickness, all of it will be wiped clean. All of it will begin anew. God in Christ will wipe every tear from our eye, and nothing will ever separate us from him again. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we can ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please rise and join me in the Apostles' Creed, which is behind the Lord. And we've gone back to the old version. Does anyone who's causing too much? <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
As we prepare to go to our good God in prayer, uh, let's think about who we need to pray for. Um, well, I know of a few, uh, and you know of more. Ramanta's family still needs our prayers, uh, especially as her sister is going through a health crisis at the moment. Uh, Roxy is still healing from her broken foot. And Jane Slate needs our prayers for health. Uh, and Terry, I understand, needs uh, our prayers. Uh, he has what is potentially a hernia. Uh, uh, as he goes and figures that out, let's pray for him. And joyfully, uh, the Brown's grandson is being baptized this morning. His name is Sean, and let's pray for him as well as he begins his new life in Christ. What else should be brought to our attention? Thank you. Um, let's remember, uh, remember uh, the family of Ronnie Coke. He passed away this week. Seeing no others, let us go to God in prayer. Lord our God, we praise you that you love us, that you love this world that you've made, that you hear our prayers out of your love, and that when we do not know how to pray, when our prayers are clumsy or feel inadequate, that your spirit prays with us in sighs too deep for words. There is in this world so much that is wrong, so much that causes us anxiety and fear and deep sadness. We need more of the gentle words of your son and fewer angry words that we shout over other angry words. We need your glory so that we can aspire to be more like you and less like selfish or self-indulgent creatures. We need your grace in a world bent on revenge, your truth in a world that seems to trade in lies, your holiness in a world that lacks it, your life in a world that is mired in death. We pray especially for people dealing with violence or tragedy wherever they may be. And today we especially remember the people of China dealing with disease and the people of Australia de dealing with fire. Make us transparent through you so that the world can become a better place, so that we may shine your grace in this world. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this congregation. Heal those who are ill. Comfort those who are grieving. Reassure those who feel troubled or frightened by what the future may hold. We remember, especially before you, Terry and Dementa and Roxy, Jane and Ronnie Cope's family. Be in the words we speak and the cards we send and the visits we make. Be in the meetings we attend as well and the committees we serve with. Make each one in this place a good and faithful servant who warms hearts and provides hopes and lends comfort so that we may all contribute to your glory and your work in the world. And Lord, we praise you this morning especially for the ways we do see your work visible, and especially for Sean, who in another church, but still in your church, is being baptized this morning. And we pray for him that you would work great wonders in his life, that you would be all he needs. Lord our God, we offer these prayers, joining our voices to the prayers of all across the world. 
and long for the day when all your children will live in your peace and praise your name. Until that day, we pray that you would give us patience and hope and root us in Jesus. You taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord, lift up his countenance upon you.